on the screen here are the covers of the Luminous Modernism catalog on the left and the original Scandinavian art exhibition catalog from 1912 by Torvald Bindisball on the right. Bindisball. Luminous Modernism looks back to the contemporary exhibition of Scandinavian art, which opened in New York in early December of 1912 before traveling to Buffalo, Toledo, Chicago, and Boston. The 165 paintings, sculptures, ceramics, and textiles included in the 1912 exhibition were selected to represent the generations, three generations of living artists in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, demonstrating the rise of locally generated Impressionism, post-Impressionism, symbolism, and early Expressionism. And I'll say parenthetically that in 1912, Iceland and Finland were not yet sovereign nations and therefore not part of the exhibition, although this time, uh, in 2011 and 2012, happily, they've joined the confederation here. The 1912 exhibition is notable alone for the fact that it was the first time in North America that Edvard Munch's paintings were exhibited. And on the right-hand side is Girl Under the Apple Tree, which is in our current exhibition, which was also exhibited in 1912. And on the left, I think Jay Clark will probably show us this view of um, an installation view of the 1912 exhibition venue in Buffalo. Moreover, the Scandinavian exhibition was visited by 69,000 museum goers uh, across the country and it garnered tremendous attention in the mass media. It also seems to have boosted museum attendance in its five host cities. And these quotes on the screen, I hope you can even see them from the back of the room. Uh, I'm not gonna take the time to read them. You can just absorb them by osmosis. Um, the quotes from newspapers of record from the five cities in which the exhibition traveled offer testimonials to the exhibition's popularity. It had a strong impact as well on a number of artists, most dramatically the group of seven in Canada who saw in the Nordic landscapes an intimacy and connection between artists and land that catalyzed their own approach to their local landscape. And on the screen is one of those uh, a comparison. Um, which we will be hearing about later. And this is a connection that was amplified in the pioneering research of Roald Nosgård, from whom we'll be hearing later today. For other artists, such as the circle around Arthur Wesley Dow in New York and in the Boston area, the paintings likely reinforced approaches to landscape, light, and formal languages already invested in their work. So the exhibition was reassuring. The various post-impressionist languages on display in the 1912 exhibition confirmed the directions all of these artists had already taken. Few US-based artists testified to having seen the Scandinavian exhibition at all, unless maybe some of you in the audience can share anecdotes with us later. We've been trying to find these reports. Some, like George Bellows, whose work underwent a radical change in 1913, who's I'm showing you on the right, comparing him with Anna Buber, uh, painting that's in our exhibition um, here on the left. Uh, George Bellows' work underwent a significant change in 1913, and he mentions the Armory Show as the stimulus for his renewed approach to painting. Others, such as Marston Hartley, may have seen the catalog of the exhibi uh, Scandinavian exhibition, and we'll hear more about that later in the work of Ivan Sloan Bjatka. Still others, like Charles Birchfield, a student in Cleveland during the run of the Toledo venue, may have learned about the deeply subjective and visionary works of the Scandinavians from his teachers. However, in the critical press, the Scandinavian exhibition raised questions within New York's avant-garde about the relationship between nationhood and artistic expression, helping to solidify and stabilize the American reception of modern art powerfully within the critical community. The Scandinavian exhibition offered a model of what was termed regional modernism, the topic of today's symposium. Figurative art rendered in a range of experimental styles that were in the first instance invested in the material, sentimental, cultural, and sensorial worlds of local topography and society. And I'm showing you a painting by Jens Ferdinand Willemsen that was in the 1912 exhibition that was understood to be a regional modernist work. This was a modernism that did not reject history and memory, a modernism that amplified regional exceptionalism, a modernism that appealed tremendously to uh, um, American critics, and perhaps most especially to some of the critics within Alfred Stieglitz's circle in New York. As I'll discuss at the end of the talk, 
the very appeal to history and memory invested in these paintings also occasioned a more troubling reception in New York from within Stieglitz's circle, and that's one based on, based on racial biology. The title of this talk is Nordic, Nordic Art in Stieglitz's America, and in it, I lay out some of the terms of the exhibition's reception in North America as distinct from what the Scandinavian artists themselves produced. I'd like to engage themes of formal innovation, geographic specificity, and racialization that appeared in the critical writing, all discourses that drove photographer, gallerist, publisher, and art impresario Alfred Stieglitz's influential project in New York, in the little galleries of the photo secession known as Gallery 291 on the upper right-hand corner of this slide, and in the pages of his influential journal Camera Work, which I show you here in the left-hand part of the slide. In so doing, I want to call attention to the differences in aspiration and ideology between the Scandinavian organizers of the exhibition and their American partners as a platform for today's symposium. Notable among all of the organizers of the exhibition and many of the critics was the urgency to articulate nationhood and region, something we'll hear in many of the about we'll hear in many of the papers today. However, the ways in which the national was constituted differed markedly between the Scandinavians and the Americans, defining modernism in a regional historical context among the Scandinavians, and, st and to some extent racializing, stereotyping, and ahistoricizing the Scandinavians on this side of the Atlantic. It's part of the exhibition's reception history. The 1912 exhibition was managed from the outset to be successful, utilizing all of the means of publicity available to 1912 art entrepreneurs. It arrived on American soil during the heyday of Alfred Stieglitz's championing of modernism here in New York, traveling to five cities. The Scandinavian exhibition also followed the pattern set in 1908 by Robert Henry and the group of eight at the Macbeth Gallery in New York, which was to proselytize new art by traveling it to multiple cities. It was accompanied by a catalog complete with lengthy essays, photographs, and biographies of all of the artists, and it contained checklists of the artist's work. So that was an, a modern addition to a modern art exhibition. Most of the works in the exhibition were for sale as the artists and organizers hoped to establish markets in the US, and Edvard Munch's paintings were valued as staggering $5,000 a piece. His contract is on the right-hand side of the screen. Munch's paintings valued as staggering $5,000 a piece, twice that of Christian Krog's most expensive work, and I've got his contract here on the left, and 10 times that of any of the other works in the exhibition, and approximately 20 times that of any of the works that were on sale at that time by most American artists. The exhibition's American curator, Christian Brenton, had already organized traveling exhibitions of recent German, French, and Spanish art, and had begun to formulate in his exhibitions and accompanying lectures and catalogs the notions of a regional modernism, of progressive new art organically tied to geography and to nationhood. And I here show you a photograph of Brenton by Paul Haviland, uh, one of Alfred Stieglitz's close colleagues. Brinton uh, had a hand at publicizing art exhibitions, it was an old hand at publicizing art exhibitions um, throughout his curatorial work, and himself was an influential critic for the Studio International, the New York Times, and other journals and magazines, uh, and where he himself often placed articles advertising and analyzing his own exhibitions, such as this article he placed in the International Studio in January of 1913. As early as March 1912, a full nine months before the exhibition opened, newspapers in New York and throughout the country ran articles based on Brinton's press releases that announced the coming exhibition, and just a couple of examples here, including um, on the upper left-hand uh, uh, side portion of the screen, um, an article announcing the coming of the Scandinavian art exhibition, including a work by Gerhard Munche, who in the end was not included in the exhibition. The Scandinavian exhibition, therefore, fitted into the newly emerging circuit of modern art promotion in the US, in which gallerists, curators, publicists, collectors, artists, and salonists formed alliances and networks to market the modern. As we'll hear all day, one of the unifying concerns within all of these networks 
was that America's art did not express America's exceptionalism, a concern that America's art was imitative, inauthentic, and superficial. The artist Robert Henry's essay, published in The Craftsman in 1909, entitled Progress in Our National Art Must Spring from the Development of Individuality and Freedom of Expression, was but one among many critical writings that articulated this concern and called upon American artists to look freshly at their immediate environments for spiritual renewal, that America was worth painting in all of its material particularism, as Robert Henry put it, down to the frozen clumps of manure on America's city streets. And at the same time, he called upon artists to put an individual stamp on their work by embracing formal languages that express spontaneity and subjective vision. This was precisely the discursive frame echoed by all of the organizers of the Scandinavian exhibition when they made their case for modern art whose strength resided in an attentiveness to the particularities of space and place and locality and atmosphere. In the Scandinavian art catalog, in fact, Christian Brinton wrote, quote, it may be unpatriotic to say so, ju but judged by current European standards, we in America are distinctly behind the times when it comes to the matter of aesthetic development. To summarize so far, everything was in place to make this not just a popularly successful exhibition in 1912, but also one whose impact should be remembered. Popular attendance, critical raves, visual and rhetorical support for ongoing efforts of modern art and presarios in New York, and so on. However, the 1912 exhibition, the Scandinavian exhibition, also arrived on the eve of the opening of the Armory Exhibition, the International Exhibition of Modern Art at the 69th Regiment Armory here in New York in February of 1913. And the drama and controversy of the Armory Exhibition, and especially the public incomprehension of Marcel Duchamp's uh, new Descending a Staircase from 1912 and one of its many caricatures here on the right, um, entirely eclipsed the um, visual impact of the Scandinavian exhibition and ushered into New York and elsewhere a model of modernism that rejected the regional and the organic. Further, the efforts of Alfred Stieglitz, one of the organizers of the Armory Show, to promote advanced formalist modernism, which he termed true, the true medium abstraction, also eclipsed the intimate regionalist works of the Nordic artists. Indeed, the Scandinavian exhibition had occasioned a minor controversy within Stieglitz's circle, enabling Gallery 291 to assert its hegemony within the New York art world. In the Scandinavian exhibition catalog, Christian Brinton had taken a cheap shot at Stieglitz's radical exhibition program, suggesting that it was mere fashion compared with the genuineness, uh, the genuineness and the coherence of the Scandinavian works. And Brinton wrote, which I have here, while it's true that we have our intermittently illuminating tabloid exhibitions at the photos discussion, nothing is yet known of modern art as a movement. And it's thus and thus alone that it should be studied, not merely from isolated, unrelated samples or specimens which confuse without in the least degree clarifying the popular mind. In reply, Stieglitz's camera work in 1913 published photographer Paul Haviland's retaliation at Brinton, which used the Scandinavian exhibition as a conservative foil against which Gallery 291's radicalism could be measured. And here on the screen, I'm just reminding us of some of the exhibitions that had taken place at Stieglitz's Gallery 291 between about 1908 and this moment when the, our exhibition opened. Or a little thereafter, uh, Rodin's figure drawings, works by Matisse, Henri Toulouse-Lautrec, Toulouse and a little bit later in 1915, an exhibition at the bottom of Picasso Brock interspersed with um, West African carvings. In an open letter dated January 25th of 1913, Haviland, whose photogravure of portrait of Brinton you saw earlier on the screen, wrote, quote, when I first read Brinton's statement, I felt, I must admit, a rather unpleasant shock at the offhanded manner in which the relentless effort during eight years of the photo secession to create an interest in and understanding of the modern was treated. I then had a chance to look at the Scandinavian paintings, wrote Haviland, but I must confess my disappointment in finding in them only a faint reflection of continental art of 20 years ago. Everywhere, on the contrary, I heard live and stimulating discussions of our exhibitions at 291, and I noticed that when the coming exhibition of international art was announced, 
and the art critics became anxious um, to become posted on the modern movement. It was to 291 that they turned. 291 seemed to be the only source of information available. End of quote. In other words, in the pages of camera work, Paul Haviland and his colleagues assured Gallery 291's authority as the premier site of radicalism and Scandinavian art as passé, as a foil, as too regional. Thus, our exhibition fell into, in part, a struggle for authority among New York critics in 1912 and 13. As many of us understand from our own research, the Scandinavian exhibition was not intended from the outset to be radical, but to offer a developmental evolution of art and ideas with the three Scandinavian, within the three Scandinavian nations, a story of coherence. Its supporting institution, the American Scandinavian Foundation, which we just heard from Ed Gallagher established in uh, just at the moment when the exhibition was being organized, was a utopian project. In the words of historian Eric Fries, the very first of the international societies to have for its sole purpose the furtherance of goodwill through cultural and educational exchanges. The exhibition was therefore a didactic show with the utopian goal of, by the foundation of solidifying cultural re relations between the US and Scandinavia, a mission that was announced as global diplomacy when the three reigning monarchs of Denmark, Sweden, and Norway agreed to serve as the exhibition's patrons, which you see in the title page of the exhibition catalog. In keeping with the foundation's pedagogical mission, three curators, each representing one of the Scandinavian nations, were tasked to, um, two of them, to make selections of artists from their homeland and then, in addition, write essays for the exhibition catalog. Carl Madsen, director of Denmark's National Museum, seen on the left in a portrait by Wilhelm Hammershoi, selected the Danish works. Jens Thies, director of Norway's National Gallery, represented on the right-hand side of the screen by Edvard Munch, made the Norwegian selections. And Swedish writer Carl Loren, portrayed at the center of the screen by Carl Larsen, was tasked with writing the Swedish section of the catalog. The three curators each bore the responsibility to reflect the contemporary art scene and provide an explanatory essay for the catalog, but each one interpreted contemporary in a different way, impelled by aesthetics, ideology, and social and cultural affinity. Unifying them all was a discussion of regionalism. Karl Madsen, himself a painter, critic, and art historian, painstakingly wove an intricate story in the catalog of triumph over Danish academic constraints in genre and facteur in painting. The Danish selections were eclectic, ranging from the pearlescent austerity of Wilhelm Hammershoi, in the two of the paintings we actually have upstairs here, to monumental canvases by Jens Ferdinand Willemsen, uh, one of which you see here and which you see in the installation view from Buffalo, as well as works by younger French intimist-inspired insp painters, tracing the modernist breakthrough in Denmark. Madsen's short essay in the exhibition catalog identified modernity and honest, uh, modesty and honesty as virtues embedded in the Danish character and in its art. And he emphasized cultural coherence and continuity and not modernist radicalism in his essay. And he wrote, every good artist expresses his nationality in new forms. The invited artists are all legitimate children of their land, and many of them have inherited some of their best qualities from the same artist who founded the Danish school of painting. His story was one of coherence. The Swede, Carl Loren, the author of several books about Swedish painting and a player in the building of Sweden's art infrastructure, put forward artists from the 1880s and 1890s generation. Carl Larsen, Prince Eugen, Bruno Liljefors, and Honor Zorn, already an art star in the US, in part because of Sweden's spectacular showing in the World's Columbian Exhibition of 1893, and because of his bravura portrait commission, such as that by Isabella Stuart Gardner. More radical Swedish artists associated with the artists' union boycotted the exhibition, and the younger generation allied with advanced French fauvism, cubism, and with German expressionism, including Sigrid Jartin, She's gone. We're excluded. There she is. She was excluded. 
The resulting Swedish selection favored panoramic views of deep forests and luminous twilight skies associated with national romanticism, such as Otto Hesselbaum's, our, uh, prin oh, he's gone too, Prince Eugen's After Rain from 1904. Lauren, um, in effect, branded Sweden through his selections as a mystical realm of belonging. There he is. He wrote in the catalog, quote, the Swedish people have always loved to penetrate nature's secrets. The true children of a people whose science, poetry, and art have refreshed themselves with almost religious ardor at the maternal breasts of nature, is the way that he characterized his artists and their land. In contrast, the Norwegian uh, curator Jens Kies, who is allied with international tendencies in his native Norway, favored works that bore a resemblance to continental vanguard art locally interpreted emphasizing the youth and poverty of Norway as a nation and the endurance of its integrity through many centuries of cultural affiliation with Denmark and then with Sweden, Peace wrote an evolutionary narrative in the catalog emphasizing the cultural roots within Norway's youthful art culture. And he used Edvard Munch as the dividing line between optically inspired art and, quote, a purely personal interpretation of the world that w was invested in Norway and left its mark on the younger artists. Although this was the most advanced section of the exhibition in formal terms, given Stieg Stieglitz's teleology of the modern, a movement toward abstraction, the Norwegian section, like the others, excluded the, the most radical young artists from its roster. Taken together, the three sections of the show suggested both distinctive national characteristics and a unified organic attachment to the North. The idea of a national enterprise intimately critical to three Scandinavia, the three Scandinavian organizers and to the utopian committee of the American Scandinavian Foundation formed a consensual representation of Scandinavia from the Scandinavian point of view. However, and this is the last little part of the talk, the reception of the exhibition from the American point of view was refracted through biological and racial theories conditioned by anxieties about America's melting pot, and we'll hear more about this this afternoon. As already noted, the 1912 exhibition's American curator was Christian Brinton, a critic who had already established a significant track record as a curator of national or regional schools. A prolific reviewer and essayist, Brinton was a lifelong champion of modern art, joining Alfred Stieglitz and others in New York um, in the effort to effect an efflorescence of advanced art in the United States. Brinton articulated his approach to modern art in an essay entitled Evolution, Not Revolution in Art, published in 1913, in which he emphasized the gradual artistic transformation from the Impressionist to the Post-Impressionist, using a Darwinist model of inheritance and selection with important um, impregnations coming from outsiders. As art, oh, sorry, um, as art historian Andrew J. Walker has noted, central to Brinton's understanding of art was the imbrication of individual endeavor into a national and racial inheritance, an idea that he deployed in all of his cultural endeavors, including this exhibition catalog at the Hispanic Society in 1909, in which he uh, attributed to Spanish art a racial endowment. Brinton's essay in the 1912 Scandinavian catalog addressed what he called an inalienable racial heritage of the Scandinavians, emphasizing the virility, sturdiness, spontaneity, unspoiled character of the, quote, restless warriors and isolated agriculturalists, the intrepid Vikings, the rugged sons of mountain and fjord. Brinton notably characterized sub his subjects with a marked degree of hyperbole that clashed with the restrained scholarly historical voice of the three Scandinavian curators whom I mentioned a moment ago. Brinton deployed these characteristics to frame Scandinavian art as original, authentic, spontaneous, and atavistic expressions of a modern spirit, distinct from and purer than that of America itself. In fact, the exhibition was for him an opportunity to educate American tastes, to offer what he called the marked unity of tone, the blonde clarity, uh, clarity so characteristic of the North. This rhetoric was, of course, embedded in Darwinist social theory, codified by Arthur de Gabineau in the 1850s, positing separate human races or species surmounted by subcategories of superior and inferior whiteness, in which the Nordics were considered to be the top of the hierarchy, 
culminating in 1916 in the United States by Madison Grant Skirlis and highly influential book, The Passing of the Great Race, which posited what he called Nordicism as the apogee of human endeavor. According to Madison Grant, both in his book and his articles of the earlier 18, uh, 1910s, the Nordics were all over the world, he said, a race of soldiers, sailors, adventurers, and explorers, but above all, of rulers, organizers, and aristocrats. The many newspaper reviews of the 1912 exhibition mirrored this Dar Darwinist mythology. The notion was to off was um, the notion was to offer admirable foreign art as not just a stimulus for American artists, but it within the discursive brain, uh, frame of breeding. Some of the overt rhetoric in this regard emerged from within the Stieglitz circle, authored by Marius de Zayas. And on the screen is Stieglitz's portrait of de Zayas and de Zayas's portrait of Stieglitz. As de Zayas, born in Mexico, was a de Zayas was a caricaturist and an art theorist whose writings excoriated the geldings and the impotence of current American art, in contrast to the virilizing effect of advanced foreign art, which could be brought into the American body and to revitalize it. Art historian uh, Lauren Kreutz has identified de Zayas' aesthetic agenda with the metaphor of both breeding and colonization. De Zayas proclaimed the producer of a robust American modernism, that the producer of a robust American modernism could be a manly conquistador who could do as did Cortez to America. De Zayas' friend and colleague, the graphic artist and critic John Nilsson Laudervik, shared perhaps less egregiously this notion of breeding authentic art. And I want to uh, conclude with, a, with a, a quotation from Laudervik. Laudervik had for years been a staunch supporter of modern European works, publishing defenses of modernism in the Century Magazine and the New York Times and in international studio, particularly defending Alfred Stieglitz's exhibitions at the Little Gallery of the Photo Secession. He also published several articles in Stieglitz's camera work. Laudervik was one of the most important interpreters, in fact, of the Scandinavian exhibition in the year 1913. For Laudervik, the Scandinavian exhibition represented precisely the kinds of authenticity, primitivism, and vitality that he, himself a Norwegian cultural nationalist, hoped would revivify American art to achieve what he called a, a democratic indigenous expression. He used the Scandinavian art exhibition as a way of celebrating individual expression and regional rootedness. In, when he published an essay entitled Intolerance in Art in the 1912 Scandinavian Review, and further in a book that he published entitled Is It Art? which was occasioned by the Armory exhibition, in which he separated the work of the genuine primitives the Norwegians, versus the pseudo-primitives, the other Europeans. Their, he claimed that their intimacy, the Norwegians and the other Scandinavians, their intimacy with the northern land and their direct expression of its energies and telluric memories rendered them atavistic, authentic, spontaneous, and unsullied, unlike the work of Marcel Duchamp. Laudvik and Brinton's emphasis on the Scandinavians' dual modernism and their primitivism supported the Stieglitz's circle's elision of race and place, shaped the terms of the exhibition's popular reception as a dose of wild primitive virilization that re renew American art, and ironically mapped onto the works of Anna Bubad, with which I'd like to conclude. Ironically, Swedish painter Anna Bubad, the only woman included in the 1912 exhibition, whose heavily impostoed view of a glacier is upstairs here in the gallery and in reproduction here on the screen, became a kind of visual talisman for the exhibition as it traveled across the country. In her, biography, the ex in the, her biography in the exhibition catalog, Bubad struck a heroic figure wrapped in rugged fur, posed heroically against a frigid landscape, which we understand from an uncropped photograph to be a, actually a cotton sheet. Her upright body, the foil for her portable easel, and her head raised as in defiance against the cold, brutal atmosphere. Indeed, several of the artists included in the exhibition catalog were represented in the snow, including Honor Zorn and um, Gunnar Hallström, but Buba's rugged frontier femininity struck a chord with the newspaper writers, and she became the perfect embodiment of Brinton's aesthetic atavist whose very painterly touch offered a homology between artistic sensibility and the very matter of the landscape and atmosphere itself. When the Scandinavian exhibition opened in New York, 
its themes of reception, its terms of reception, um, had already been forged by Alfred Stieglitz's call for a revolution in aesthetics, Christian Brinton's, John Nielsen Laudovic's, and Marius de Zayas's evolutionary scientism, and by the growing body of Nordicist social theorists. All of this was, of course, outside the consciousness of the Scandinavian artists and curators, and particularly the sponsoring foundation, who endeavored to educate Americans to the history and current achievements of Scandinavian art. It was also extrinsic to the art itself. However, as we look to the celebratory reception of the exhibition, the large crowds, and even the acknowledgement of the cross-Atlantic uniting of the cheerful Scandinavians with the paintings that were brought to them, we need to recognize that it is these terms, already shaped by Stieglitz's America, in which the modern and the atavistic were coextensive, as Randall Griffey will tell us later, and into which the artists themselves, perhaps even against their wills, with their many sincere strategies of nation building, unwittingly stepped. Thank you.